Now, the reality is that this form of flying is a little more dangerous than other forms of flying, so the uh, correct attire is essential if we do have a forced landing. That is a correctly fitting helmet, gloves, overalls and boots. The more of your body that can be uh, covered in case of a fire, the far better chances you have of surviving. And uh, with a good helmet, you've got a far better chance of surviving a fire if you don't get knocked out. Low level familiarisation, flying at uh, low level. Top. The initial height we're looking at is uh, top dressing height. The main thing uh, that we need to be concerned about with low level flying is we have the correct power setting uh, for the weight of the aircraft and the uh, correct cruise speed. The aircraft should be trimmed slightly nose up. We must increase our vigilance. Remember at low level we're going to have a lot more obstacles. And we want to be able to uh, safely uh, negotiate all our obstacles. At top dressing height, it's not, not quite as bad. Our assessment of the height is very hard. Our altimeter is uh, the lower we get becomes more unreliable. And you'll find the lower we get, the more turbulence we're going to create. Our landmarks do take on a different shape in that we are now not looking directly down on them. We are starting to get a horizontal profile on them. Next I'll take you down to six feet and a spray height. What we're going to do is follow the contour of the ground and you'll be able to see what I meant about the uh, difference in um, the perspective that obstacles take on. We're now lowering down a spray height. Early anticipation of uh, Power setting is required here to try and maintain an even ground speed. As you can see there, distances and heights become a lot more unreliable and we must make early decisions on pull-ups and obstacle avoidance. Remember if we have a downwind component or a greater all-up weight of the aircraft as we would be when we were initially full, chemical. The allowance we must make must be greater than that that we'd make with a lighter aeroplane or the aircraft going into wind. We'll just run back up and have a look at those obstacles again. taken on a totally different perspective now. We're looking straight at them and not down them. Assessing wind speed and direction from the air. There are several methods. Smoke will give us a valuable indication of wind direction. Wind speed can be determined from smoke by noting the speed at which it rises from the ground. Trees are also good, but unless the wind is strong, it's difficult to determine its direction. Even a gentle breeze will ripple the surface of water on dams and lakes. Now, in this case, the upwind surface of the dam is calm, indicating a northeasterly wind. Wind can also be sensed by aircraft drift. Right, the effect of crosswind is if we don't make any allowance for drift, the aircraft will drift off the line. So what we have to do is slight nose into wind 
so as we can maintain a straight line down the field. Medium turns, medium turns at low level. The important thing is to keep a good look out. A medium turn is 30 degrees, note the attitude. We don't have to increase our power. We must keep a good look out for obstacles or even uh, contours in the ground. As we're so low to the ground, as you can see here, we have a rising contour, meaning we are getting lower to the ground even though we're maintaining the same height. Beware of uh, the increased inertia of the aircraft and also the drift. Today we don't have a great deal of drift, but in a uh, later subject we'll go into drift in more detail. What we're really looking for here is an accurate balance turn at 30 degrees. a good look out. We will need to increase our power slightly to compensate for the increased angle of bank. We're going to have increased uh, inertia, so we will need to uh, make the turn slightly wider and keep a good eye out for obstacles. We're going to use 45 degrees angle of bank. The idea here is a constant angle of bank and a constant height above the ground. You'll find you'll be, uh, the tendency here will either be to gain height or lose height, as it's much harder to control at the steeper angle of bank. turn the aircraft must be flown close to the stall. The things to remember in a maximum rate turn are maintain the attitude with your uh, pitch using the control column. If the aircraft uh, does start to descend don't try and raise the nose by increasing the uh, nose attitude. This will only uh, make the aircraft stall. What we must do is relax the angle of bank. If we have a nose high attitude when we're close to the stall, well then of course we can uh, lower the nose by increasing the angle of bank. We must be very sensitive on the control. The last thing we want to do is for the aircraft to uh, for able to control the aircraft and stall it. The thing that we are looking for, of course, is that you can recognise the approach of the stall, recognise that we are on it. We can hear the stall warning blowing there. We have quite a uh, slow airspeed now, but we also have a very moderate angle of bank. 
find any uh, further increase in angle of bank, and the aircraft would, in actual fact, stall. If we uh, do happen to drop a wing in this situation, don't try and pick it up with uh, aileron. Pick it up with the use of opposite rudder. If we try and pick it up with aileron, of course, we will stall. The uh, slower wing in the aircraft will uh, tend to roll onto its back. just after takeoff. Keep a good look out for obstacles. We have a gentle angle of bank. Make sure we do have the uh, climb power applied. And remember that we're going to have a higher stalling speed uh, promoted by, of course, our uh, increased angle of bank from a straight out climb. making a climbing turn downwind. Same rule applies, gentle angle of bank. Remember your terrain clearance. It's very important to maintain airspeed. Don't get it confused with the ground speed. Make sure you've got the right airspeed. Watch for wind gradients. And you'll, they'll tend to uh, reduce your airspeed, uh, particularly in gusty conditions. Uh, the effect of wind. What we're going to do in, uh, in this uh, sequence is go out and fly a race course pattern. Uh, tracking into wind, we'll have an airspeed of 105 knots, which will give us a decreased ground speed back to 85 knots. Upwind turn, what we've got to watch out for is the drift of the aircraft. We'll drift back downwind, just watch out for obstacles. When we fly downwind, our airspeed will remain constant, but our ground speed uh, will increase by uh, 20 knots. And turning downwind, uh, remember the uh, inertia of the aircraft will carry us further downwind than the, we're going to require. So just beware of obstacles downwind. If we take another situation where the aircraft is turning into wind, the illusion we'll get here is that the aeroplane is travelling slower. In actual fact, their airspeed's the same, it's only the ground speed that's changed. If we do a turn upwind, we'll find the illusion we get here as we skid into the turn. In actual fact, if we keep balanced, all we're doing is drifting downwind. Coming downwind, we get the illusion that the airspeed is fast, uh, the ground speed is faster. And turning downwind, we get the illusion that we're slipping out of the turn. In actual fact, we're just drifting across the field. If we're flying into wind, we get an illusion. We're travelling at a, a slower uh, airspeed. In actual fact, it's not the airspeed that's decreased. It's our ground speed due to the headwind component. 
turning upwind. As we turn upwind, we'll find we'll get the illusion that the aircraft is skidding in the turn. In actual fact, it's not skidding. What we are, in actual fact, doing is drifting across the ground. As we turn downwind, we get the tendency to think that we're going faster than we actually are. Now, as long as the airspeed is correct, then we don't touch our power settings. Turning downwind, we get the illusion that we're slipping in the turn. In actual fact, if the ball is in the centre, then the aeroplane is balanced and we're flying the aircraft correctly. Now what we must remember is these are illusions, but the drift we're experiencing across the paddock is an actual fact of reality. We must allow enough room on all our turns so as we do not drift into any obstacle at low level. We make the turn, we check we're doing an upwind turn here. We check on the downwind side that we're not going to drift back into any obstacle. And you can see we're holding the ball in the centre. Going downwind now. In our downwind turn, check no obstacles further downwind. As we drift across the paddock, we are still holding a ball in the centre. Engine failure at low level. When we're flying at low level, always be on the lookout for a forced landing paddock. You just never know when we're going to have an engine failure. We do not have much time to think. If we have an engine failure at low level, lower the nose, pick a paddock and jettison our load. Remember, only turn 30 degrees are enough to miss obstacles. Switcher switches off, fuel off if there's time. to recognise the symptoms of stall at high level. Aircraft nose high, airspeed decreasing, controls becoming ineffective, lowering of noise, the aircraft stalls and nose drops to recover, we apply full power, forward stick, the aeroplane dies, we lose considerable height and the aeroplane becomes unstalled. However, when we're stalling at low level, the need to recognise the approach to the stall is even more uh, apparent. As the aeroplane stalls, the nose will start to pitch forward. This time we just relax the back pressure and don't pull forward. The nose will come level with the horizon. Simultaneously we apply full power and allow the aeroplane to pull out. This will allow us a minimum height loss in the stall. Initially we will do a normal stall and a powered recovery from straight level attitude. With the aircraft clean, no flaps, etc. Because we are now at low level, we want to be able to recognise the approach of the stall and we want to be able to recover it with a minimum height loss. As the aircraft uh, approaches the stall, we're going to have falling airspeed, decreased uh, control effectiveness. Some aircraft we will get buffeting, 
we'll get sink, we'll get the store warning blowing, and the nose will tend to drop away. Recover by relaxing the back pressure and applying full power and pulling the aircraft out of the stall with a minimum height loss. Okay, I'd like you to note the airspeed at which the aircraft stalls at. And in this stall, we'll also note the height loss. Aircraft stall at approximately 50 knots. Our hard loss is somewhere in the vicinity of 50 feet. We'll just symptoms once again. Nose drops away, relax the back pressure, get the nose down, the airspeed's building up, the aeroplane's unstalled. We've lost somewhere in the vicinity of 200 feet. This time I will use full flap for the stall. I'd like you to note the um, the airspeed at which we stall at. We'll have a lower nose attitude in the stall and on the recovery. Note, 40 knots. Same recovery technique and note the height. in the turn, which we're about to do now. Remember we're going to have a, the higher the angle of bank, the higher the stalling speed's going to be. If we get a wing drop, pick it up with rudder, not aileron. Aircraft stalls. We notice the aircraft tried to flick out of the turn. We just relax the back pressure and the aircraft immediately came out of the stall. Stall in the opposite direction in a right-hand turn. Stall warning's going. The aircraft now stalled. Drops away. Full power, relax the back pressure and ease out of the stall. we'll get a lowering of our stall speed. Our control effectiveness in the uh, rudder control and the elevator control is going to be quite increased due to the uh, slipstream effect still over them. We still use the uh, standard recovery. If we get a wing drop, pick it up with uh, rudder, not other one. And note the speed at which the aircraft stalls at. Slight wing drop we pick up with opposite rudder. And our standard recovery. Remember that with power, you will tend to get a wing drop due to the torque effect of the engine. And we do have a very high nose attitude.
just going to drop down to 300 feet. And I will uh, give you at that stage an incipient stall. What we're looking at here is the uh, approach to the stall, just so you can recognise when you are near the stall and recover. feet. We're flying around and waiting for the aircraft to stall. Note the airspeed dropping away. Very sloppy controls. The stall warning starts to blow and the slight buffeting. The aircraft is approaching the stall. At this stage we should do something to recover. And just use a standard recovery technique. Relax the back pressure, back to full power. We'll do a stall in a right hand turn. There we are, right on the verge of the stall now. Recover, relax the back pressure, full power, and the aircraft recovers straight away. Finally, a look at that stall and recovery air to air.